good talks over uh, all the themes in chapter 3. Tonight we'll uh, try to get through a couple of them in, in the time that we have. So, John chapter 3 picks up, and Jesus is still in Jerusalem. Remember, when chapter 2 ends, he has just, uh, you know, gone into the temple and uh, basically just run everybody out, all the money changers. He makes a whip of cords, and he does this as a sign. He says, uh, you shall, uh, you know, you shall, not, you shall turn my father's house into a den of robbers. I shall be at the house of prayer. He does something like that. And Jesus returns to Jerusalem, and at the end of chapter 2, he has sort of an initial uh, confrontation with the temple authorities, the, the priests, and the Pharisees, and they do not like what Jesus is doing. He's messing up the status quo, he's messing up business, so they are not having it. And so chapter 3 picks up, and it's nighttime. And uh, we know John loves to use the, the themes of light and dark to uh, describe sort of a deeper, a deeper setting, a, something deeper that's going on. And so we find Jesus here alone at night, and a lone Pharisee comes to meet him. Maybe this work if I turn it on. Meet Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus is your uh, standard Pharisee. Uh, and the Pharisees were the ruling uh, Jewish leaders of the day. It was during a time uh, within Judaism where keeping the law was the your best bet in maintaining a right relationship with God. If you maintain the letter of the law and you keep it and you go beyond keeping it, that's when God is going to bless you, and that's when God is going to deliver you and to, to redeem you. And so the whole nation of Israel was just obsessed with keeping the law no matter what. And there was a particular sect um, of religious authorities called the Pharisees that excelled in keeping the law. They were the pros. They knew all the laws. They could interpret them. They had written additional literature in helping people to understand how to apply the laws in different situations. And they, basically, because of their extreme knowledge in this area, because of their authority, they ended up becoming uh, rulers over the Jews. And that's where uh, what Nicodemus also is. And it's mentioned right there, Nicodemus, a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews. The Jews were sort of oppressed under, not only under the weight of Roman uh, dictatorship, but also under the weight of the law that the Pharisees were imposing upon the people. They couldn't really, the people couldn't really get anywhere because the laws were so strict. And you have, uh, you have instances of this found in John's gospel that we'll get into, uh, you know, in the weeks ahead. But like, sick people couldn't even pick up their mat on the Sabbath because. It wasn't allowed. You know, just kind of common sense stuff that they weren't allowed to do. And this was all imposed on them by the Pharisees. Uh, Nicodemus, who is one of them. And Nicodemus, his name can actually be uh, dissected and translated into people ruler. So here Nicodemus is coming sort of as a representative of the, uh, of the elite, of the religious authorities of the day that were not taking too kindly to Jesus' message. And so Nicodemus comes along. He comes in secret. It's likely that nobody else knew that he was coming. He didn't want his peers, his colleagues, to find out that he was sort of consorting with the enemy. But nevertheless, he had to come. So he picks a time where it's dark. This darkness can show sort of like the darkness that Israel is in right now under the law, or it can sort of uh, highlight the intellectual darkness that Nicodemus himself is in before he meets Jesus. But nevertheless, Nicodemus seems to be a well-meaning person. I mean, he's a Pharisee, so he's probably a little bit pretentious about how he is, but he's still drawn to Jesus. He wants to know more, and he's willing to risk uh, his reputation in order to meet with Jesus. So he's probably not too bad of a guy, uh, to be frank. He's obviously very zealous for God, for the, for the law, for Torah, the first five books of the Bible which contain the law. And the story of the Exodus of Egypt. Is that a rolling pin he's working there, or is that the Torah? <laughs> well, I guess it's the Torah, but 
I mean, that's another use of the Maybe he's about to cook. Okay. So, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, uh, we, uh, you know, we believe that you have come from God because nobody can do the things that you've done. So he's trying to butter Jesus up a little bit, but he's also trying to command the conversation by saying, hey, we acknowledge you. We affirm you. So he's speaking from this place of authority, saying, saying yes, yes, you're the new guy. You're, you're, you, you have all these messages, but we're the establishment. We have the authority. We have the right to confirm you and your ministry. That we're doing. So Nicodemus is kind of trying to do that. And Jesus is not having it whatsoever. He immediately says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus thought he had it. He thought he, he, thought he had sized up Jesus. Uh, he thought he knew you know, where Jesus was coming from. But Jesus turns it around and says, actually, you don't even know what you're talking about, Mr. Religious Authority. And because he's challenging Nicodemus, it's assumption that if you keep the law, if you do good, if you're a good person, then you can see the kingdom of God. You can get into heaven. And, you know, this is sort of a, a commonly held belief in our own day is if we're simply a good person, if we do right, we can get into heaven. But Jesus said, no, that's actually not possible. The only way to get to heaven is to be born again. Pretty confusing for Nicodemus, obviously. And that's because uh, Jesus here uses a word called anathem, uh, which is a uh, Greek word that can mean two different things. It can either mean again, or it can also mean from heaven or from above. So there's a double meaning that John is playing with and that Jesus is using, is using to not only confuse Nicodemus, but try to get him to see a bigger, to try to get him to see a bigger picture. He must be regenerated, uh, which is another way for, he must be born again in a sense, but that comes from above. And he says that this comes through water and spirit. And so what Christ says to him is something like this. If you're not born again, if you do not share in the spirit that comes through the washing of regeneration, everything you think about me will be from a human point of view, not a spiritual one. And this is a theme that is very prevalent in John chapter 3. Earthly view versus spiritual view. Flesh versus new born again flesh. How you perceive yourself from an earthly point of view or how you see yourself through the lens of God or through the lens of Christ. We see this with uh, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus and we'll also see this eventually with St. John later on in the chapter. It says, everything you think about me will be from a human point of view, not a spiritual one, unless you're born again through water and spirit. So basically, no matter how hard we try, no matter how good we are to try to get to God, to try to reconnect with God, you know, where we reestablish that connection that was lost through sin, we can't come close. A law can't help us. Being nice to other people can't help us. Only Jesus can help us reestablish that link between heaven and earth. Remember at the end of John chapter 1 where Jesus says that he's the, the ladder, Jacob's ladder that connects heaven and earth. That's how we do it. It can only be through that ladder, through Jesus Christ. And here he's giving us the means to attain that connection, that is, through baptism. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus is making a clear reference to the sacrament of baptism, which is a spiritual rebirth in Christ. And there we have a little kid that's lucky enough not to be. <laughs> Pretty terrifying. So St. Gregory of Naz Nazianzus says, And indeed from the spirit comes our new birth. And from the new birth, our new creation. And from the new creation, our deeper knowledge of the dignity of him from whom it is derived. It is through a rebirth, this new creation, for we are born in Christ, that we are able to gain a deeper knowledge of him. And it's this whole idea of new birth or regeneration, baptismal re regeneration, that we, uh, 
that from which we get the doctrine of, of that. So it is in baptism that we receive the forgiveness of sins and a new life in Christ. <coughs> and it is this passage that we that we Christians face the doctrine of baptismal re regeneration. That means new life, regenerate, to be born again. So that's where baptism comes from. And we have that also in other places of the Bible. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come in. And also in Romans, Paul continues, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So, in baptismal regeneration, through a, there occurs within that a death, a death of one's earthly self, a death of what that sin which clings to us because of our human nature. And it's a new life born again in Christ. So once we are baptized, and once we take on that life of baptism, um, we should live um, new lives. We should be different people after our baptism. Through how we act, through how we interact with others, through how we see ourselves in relation to God, and how we see ourselves in relation to the church. Our whole life, every aspect of it, should be affected by our new birth, by literally beginning anew um, with Christ as our guide. And Basil the Great says, For the regeneration, as indeed the name shows, is a beginning of a second life. So before beginning the second, it is necessary to put an end to the first. That's what Jesus is talking about here. To be born from above, or be born from heaven. And salvation is inseparably linked to baptism. Jesus makes baptism the gateway to eternal life. This is, how we, this is how we are able to walk in the light, as he goes on to say later in this chapter. It is how we are able to cling to our salvation. It's through this baptism, through the gateway. And so, kind of as a map of that, here is a very ancient Christian baptismal font. Christians at that period, uh, you know, it was very similar to the Jewish uh, mikvahs. Is that how you say it, mikvah? Yeah. And they would begin on one side, and they would walk in and pass through the waters, in this case. And having walk, come into the water in old person, in old life, they come up, they emerge from the waters of baptism, a new child of God. So, as that sort of illustrates, new life in Christ means walking in the light. It means becoming a new person, a different person. Because of your baptism, because of your death and the new life you've been given. And this should definitely be distinguished from merely keeping the law as Nicodemus was doing it. It goes back to how can you reach God? You can't reach God except through Christ's help. Through Christ's help, which is rebirth in water and spirit. That's how we attain God. That's how we attain salvation, forgiveness of sins. It's this new life. Not just keeping the law. Keeping the law was helpful uh, back before Christ. It was helpful because it helped people discern um, what it was like to be, or what God wanted his people to be like. What kind of a people it was to be the people of God. But it couldn't save them. It couldn't. Jesus came to save them through baptism. Any questions on baptismal regeneration? Is that correct? Can, can Father John help me? Mikvah? Um, and so in, in Judaism, there were a lot of uh, purification rituals. The Jews were practically obsessed with keeping oneself clean, uh, with bodily cleanliness. And that was done through these mikvahs and you know, Jewish ceremonies. It was also done in just various parts of life, like walking in to a house, they would take their sandals off and wash their feet. So the idea of baptism or cleansing one, oneself was already very prevalent at the time of Jesus. Um, so yeah, it's sort of like a ritual cleansing that they would that they would undertake. Very similar similar to what that baptism will find. 
Okay. So now we are transitioning in the chapter uh, to sort of a, a, a different story. Now, Jesus has been in Jerusalem for the past couple of events. Now, it was the Passover. So there are literally millions of people all gathered around Jerusalem, and they're buzzing with this new prophet who's performing these signs from God. And they're amazed, and Jesus is causing quite a stir among the people and among the re religious leaders. So now might be the smart time for him to maybe, you know, head back and let things settle down before uh, he, again, you know, sort of takes up ministry. But that is not Jesus' plan at all. He leaves Jerusalem, where there are thousands of people gathered around to, you know, basically hear what he has to say and do. And he goes to where John the Baptist is. And at this time, John the Baptist was basically the closest thing that we could think of as a celebrity um, at this point. Not in like a bad sense, but as in like a really, really well-known figure. Everybody knew where he was and what he was doing. And at the time of Jesus, it wasn't just John and a couple of disciples and then maybe a small group on the banks of the Jordan River waiting to be baptized. Kind of like, you know, this serene-looking picture right here. There were literally thousands of people flocking all around the river waiting to hear the words of this prophet, John the Baptist, talk about the coming Messiah. Thousands were gathering to him, waiting and wanting to hear his message of hope and his message of repentance of sins. So there's thousands of people around John, so that's where Jesus goes. He's going to continue to be with those thousands of people uh, so that they can hear the, the good news that the kingdom of God was here. And so... Just uh, for reference, this is the last time John appears in John's gospel. John the Baptist, this, you don't know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> See, I get confused. Uh, so this is his last appearance, and that sort of marks the, uh, the full, uh, you know, the full gear of Jesus' ministry. He's really amping it up at this point, and we see why. Um, you know, just... A person, okay, so John is baptizing in the Jordan. And turns out Jesus has showed up, and his disciples are just a little ways away, also baptizing in the Jordan. Now, we would think this would be a problem, but John's disciples seem to have a little beef with, with this fact. They go up to John and they say, Hey, John, Jesus' disciples, this guy who you bore witness to, now he's now he's baptizing. What gives? Shouldn't this be you? Aren't you better? And John responds, saying, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. John's response to his disciples' envy is one of humility. He doesn't rebuke them, but he gently reorients them. He tells them, hey, there's no rivalry here. I, my whole purpose in this world was to point you to that person, to Jesus. That was my job, to proclaim the way of the Lord. And now that Jesus is here, my joy is complete because he is finally here. He doesn't rebuke them. He's gentle, and he's humble in saying it. He says it's, it's his show now, and that's why um, I'm overjoyed. So John's humility is proof that humility is what makes one great, not the other way around. As Jesus himself says, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. John is here sort of the example of, of the uh, sort of the new age under Christ, where it's not about the armies you command. It's not about how good you are at doing good things like Nicodemus. It's not how good you are at following the law. It's not how powerful you are or how smart you are. It's about humility. Humility towards yourself and towards others. John's humility is what made him great. And we are invited to take part in that humility as well. When we, don't, when we don't focus on ourselves, but rather focus on others, and when we focus on God, that is when we are great. That is when God 
elevates us because we're becoming more like him. And that's sort of exemplified in what John says. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. John's role has been completed. He's ran the race, and he's proclaimed the gospel. He's gathered thousands of people around him, and now he's going to step back and let those thousands of people gather around Christ. That was his purpose, and he makes it very clear. So he sets the example of how we should view our life with Christ. Not only should we practice humility, but how can we de uh, decrease so that God can increase? St. Augustine says, Will you glory in yourself? You will grow, but you will grow worse in your evil. For whoever grows worse is justly decreased. Let God then, who is ever perfect, grow and grow in you. For the more you understand God and apprehend him, he seems to be growing in you. So it's not about ourselves growing uh, in, really in our own holiness or how we perceive us ourselves to be. It's not about us uh, trying to better ourselves because, well, we should be bettering ourselves. But when we better ourselves apart from God, when we separate ourselves from God and focus on only us, that is when we actually decrease because God is what makes us good and grow. And Paul sort of said the same thing. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The main object is to die so that Christ can live fully in us and be glorified in our lives. The less we live for ourselves and the more we live for Christ, that is when uh, we are most increased because Christ is increased in us. Are y'all following me? No? So to decrease means to focus less on ourselves. It means to focus less on our own sort of personal problems or focus and have, uh, basically focus on things apart from God. We need to include God in everything that we do. When we focus more, more, more on ourselves, we are growing in pride, basically. We're trying to become like God. So that's how we decrease when, when we focus more on ourselves. Only we increase when we focus on glorifying God in our lives. When we make him our priority, or when we are encountering problems like anxieties and troubles at work or in family or at school, when we attach God to those issues, or when we place our faith in him in those issues, that's when we glorify him, because we're letting him take the steering wheel. And we're increasing in our faith by giving him power over these situations in our lives. He says, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who, he who comes from heaven is above all. So Christ is infinitely great in heaven. But he, when he came to earth, he became lesser for our sake so that he might grow within us. So we need to focus on heavenly things. He says Christ is heavenly and not on earthly things. And I believe that's it. Are there any questions? All right, if you would all stand for a prayer with me.